I just want to mention to the people who uh, are looking at the posters out here, between 4 and 6 o'clock, the authors of those posters will be presenting them. And so if you're having trouble just reading through or understanding, that's a time when you'll really be able to follow the posters best. So now the next session that we're going to have, we have entitled the Deek Talks. This is where we have people from the university, both the medical school and um, at the Rinalda campus, as well as people from the community presenting tw uh, really what should be 12 minute talks with three minutes of questions. And then after that, there'll be a 15 minute session where you can ask questions to all the speakers for that session. But before we start, I have another honor here in presenting to you, introducing the provost of Wake Forest University, uh, Dr. Kirsch. Thanks, Danny. And what an exhilarating two days this is. Um, I have a goddaughter who's a junior at Wake Forest um, who I see probably a little more often than she'd like. I imagine my role to be parental, and so he, her, her uh, mother lives far, far away. So, And I encouraged her to go to some piece of yesterday. I send her things to go to and never hear back. She may go, she may not. But she wrote me last night the most beautiful, enthusiastic text, of course. Uh, lots of abbreviations and emoticons, but um, it was, I'm going to figure out a way, I don't know this yet, but some young person has the technology to save it and send it to Christina and Danny and other organizers because it was lovely. Um, she's 19 years old and said it's the best thing she's done at Wake Forest. Yesterday evening, um, alas, while you all were enjoying J.L. Shansky, I was at a community event um, that I'm part of a thought for some part of on poverty. And one of our um, frequent attendees and most spirited members of the Winston-Salem community, let me say, she is known to many of you here. I will not say her name. Um, she was here yesterday morning, but is not here now. And hardly a week goes by when I don't hear from her. And I love her dearly. And she tells me basically what's going wrong at Wake Forest and how we're <laughs> not connecting the community as we should and how I should get this right and that right. It's, you know, we, Every university I've been at, there's those wonderful, engaged community members. And she came marching up to me as this community event started. And I thought, oh boy, um, and <laughs> steeled myself. And she said, I just want to tell you, which is how she begins everything, what an amazing day I had yesterday, or this, today. She'd seen Liz Lehrman's talk in the morning. And the one after that, she'd stayed for the morning and into the afternoon. Um, and she said, finally, you've done something that's worth talking about. Uh, <laughs> so. Thanks to our organizers from age 19 to probably 82, um, a remarkable success. I want to take, I'm going to model this very quick set of deep talks coming and just take literally a minute to say how important the interdisciplinary nature of this event is. If you aren't spending all your life at a university, it may seem seamless and easy to bring together folks from different disciplines, um, not just across the sciences or humanities, but both from different schools, medical school, law school, um, divinity school, from different universities. Um, we often lament how in this university-rich triad, we rarely see our colleagues from UNCG, Winston-Salem State, just across town, Salem College and the like. Everybody's here. And that is difficult to do in universities. We tend to burrow deep into our individual academic disciplines, into our schools, both within Wake Forest and then across wherever we happen to be teaching and doing research and creative work. And this represents the single most interdisciplinary event I've been part of since coming back to Wake as provost nearly four years ago. And that is a remarkable achievement. <laughs> Indeed. And another I word is intercommunity. Um, as I look across the room, I see friends from all walks of Winston-Salem life. And that feels enormously important as well. Wake Forest is striving to be as good a neighbor as we can be, a better neighbor, frankly, um, in Winston-Salem. As many of you may have seen the paper this morning, we're beginning to locate downtown facilities. Um, it won't so much be a bucolic campus up on what some local residents still call the hill. 
but we're going to be right there in the heart of downtown, and this feels like a significant, powerful down payment, as it were, on that community engagement. It's wonderful to see so many friends and new friends from across Winston-Salem and indeed the triad here today. So a deep bow of gratitude to you for being here and participating, to our amazing organizers, Christina, Danny, and many others who've made this go. Um, on behalf of the university, I know the president was here as well, but we are so thrilled this is happening. And as you hear this next round of talks, you're again going to hear from all parts of um, the world of higher education and, and indeed the community. And keep in mind what a rare jewel that is. We want to do more of it, and your presence and engagement makes that possible. Thanks. And I get to say next that Christina Hugenschmidt will take us forward into what, what is about to happen. So I am Christina Hugenschmidt, and that would be the neuroscience Christina, as opposed to the dance Christina, in case you were wondering. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce today our series of Deke Talks. The first people who are going to be speaking are going to be Mary DeShazer and Richard McQuellen. The title of their talk is Living in Mortal Time, Clinical and Literary Perspectives. Dr. DeShazer is a professor emerita of the Department of English, Women's Gender, Race, and Sexuality Studies at Wake Forest University. And Dr. McQuellen is a professor of medicine and the director of psychosocial oncology and cancer patient support programs at the hospital. So this is exactly the kind of um, collaboration and work that we're hoping will focus, and they're great people to start us off. Thank you, Rogan and Christina, for um, introducing us. Um, we're very happy to be here today. Uh, I met Richard McQuellen actually. Yeah, sorry. I met, can you hear me now? No. You can take it out. Okay. How's this? <laughs> okay. Uh, I met Richard McQuellen three years ago at another interdisciplinary conference sponsored by the Wake Forest Humanities Center, the Medical Center, and some other units at the university, a uh, conference on narrative medicine. And at that time, we uh, had a very uh, stimulating conversation about our mutual interest in medical humanities and uh, compassionate caregiving. And that conversation turned into a series of collaborations. We began meeting regularly to talk about introducing to Wake Forest campus um, an interdisciplinary course uh, that eventually was entitled Reading Illness Narratives that we taught in the uh, spring of 2014. And that was a very exciting um, venture that involved students from uh, bioethics, uh, literature, uh, pre-medical students, graduate students in uh, education and English, and really was um, an extremely enlightening experience in which I learned far more than I taught. Me too. <laughs> Just very briefly, um, uh, Mary might not say this, but she's been recruited to volunteer with our program now, so it's a wonderful to have her on Wednesdays because she has a, an ear um, for listening carefully and responding very thoughtfully. So we have a, a, a wonderful collaboration that has bared, bore, bared fruit, good fruit, born. Born, <laughs> born good fruit, including my wonderful colleague who's now a volunteer and she's not missing her volunteer day today. It's Wednesday afternoon. We hope to never see you in the cancer center, by the way, with uh, only to visit. So I'm going to begin the presentation with a uh, discussion of my research and um, teaching on mortality and meaning in contemporary women's uh, autothanatography. And, sorry. I stand corrected. Um, autothanatography is uh, another word for life writing about dying, and life writing is a term that encompasses women's, uh, well men's too, but I focus on women's writing as a gender study scholar, uh, that encompasses autobiography, memoir, um, photography, um, all forms of representation that are um, um, 
personal, and they can be published or not published, although, of course, I tend to concentrate on published writing as a scholar. Uh, in her academic study, uh, Mirror Talk, Susanna Egan asked the very provocative questions, how, how do people who are terminally ill think autobiographically? And a parallel set of questions for me include how can readers best bear ethical witness to stories of the dying? Uh, how do we learn to approach these narratives with empathy and identification rather than with voyeurism, horror, or detachment? And what new knowledge do these literary works offer us? Uh, when I uh, was writing my, my books on this subject, Fractured Borders and Mammographies, I found uh, a lot of keywords and concepts helpful. So I thought I'd share a few of those with you briefly here. Uh, the idea of bodies, mourning, and witness. Um, obviously, you write about um, the end of life and mortality. You are writing about embodiment and uh, embodiment in crisis. Uh, there's grief work involved in that representation and in the kind of soul searching that's necessary to do this sort of writing, I believe. And uh, you're looking overtly or indirectly for people to bear witness as readers. And of course, it's an act of faith, a leap of faith, kind of like teaching, because you don't know if people are going to find the uh, messages and reflections and revelations, often of a very deeply personal nature that you share, uh, whether they're going to take those to heart and what kind of reaction they're going to have. But there's a kind of testimonial agency, which is a, I don't know, a kind of critical way of saying a, a strength and a courage that I believe is necessary to come forth, particularly when you're ill and you're facing uh, an illness that's been described to you as terminal. Um, how do you find the uh, voice in that part of life? And yet many, many people do. Um, some scholars in this field believe that there's a, an implicit reader-writer contract that you engage in as such, a, um, such an autobiographer, um, that you just um, believe that there will be the possibility of touching someone in the deepest parts of themselves and therefore that there can be a communication that is enriching uh, to you, and it's part of your legacy for the future, I think, if you're a writer of autothanatography. And the writers I've studied um, reckon with their mortality, or what um, Richard McQuellen calls mortal time, which we'll hear more about in a moment, in a number of different ways, but I've chosen to talk a little bit about humor, spirituality, serenity, and um, outrage. Not all people who confront aging are old, and so the first group that I'm going to briefly touch on of autothanatographers ages 30 through 45 include Ruth Picardi, Miriam Engelberg, and Stephanie Byram, and I'm just going to briefly, very briefly, say something about each of them. Ruth Picardi was a British journalist known for her raw humor and heartbreaking honesty in the face of breast cancer. She was a columnist for The Guardian, and her book, Before I Say Goodbye, is a hybrid memoir composed of her Guardian columns, letters from her readers, emails to and from friends, and journal entries. And she begins it by saying, you're 32, overweight, but still, you've got a husband who has all of his own hair. Your one-year-old twins are sleeping through the night, and you might be interviewing George Clooney next week. But guess what? That uh, lump you have in your left breast, I'm sorry to say, it's actually stage three cancer and you have a 50-50 chance of living five years. And the memoir goes on and, you know, sadly she becomes um, ill with a brain metastasis and she says uh, what hurts most is losing the future. And of course she goes into a, a mode of anguish in writing this and sharing it with her readers. I won't be there to clap when my beloved babies learn to write their names. And then she turns to this kind of defiant humor. And she says, then there's the really important stuff. I won't be able to watch the fourth series of ER. <laughs> and as a binge watcher of Homeland, I can identify with that. Um, Miriam Engelberg wrote the uh, wonderfully titled memoir, Cancer Made Me a Shallower Person. And this, of course, is a riff on the um, 
cultural belief, and it's a deeply held belief, and it's certainly a valid and a valiant one that cancer in some cases can make us stronger, make us wiser, but she says, not me, I'm shallow, or I'm turning <laughs> to every form of escape that I can manage. She also critiques in this graphic novel, it's actually a comic strip because she was a cartoonist. She was 45 when she died, and she said, um, she talks about patient blaming and how we all uh, tend to think, well, that person was overweight or that person didn't eat the right things. And she said, I caused this by eating too much cheese. I should never have relaxed and enjoyed my life. Uh, a different approach is taken by Stephanie Byram, uh, who collaborated with a photographer friend of hers, um, whose name is Charlie Brodsky, on doing a photographic chronicle of her journey with breast cancer. She was a graduate student, 30 years old, when she was diagnosed. And um, her response was initially not anything resembling serenity or spirituality. It was horror. She said, my body could no longer be trusted. I was no longer whole. But then a turning point came when she decided to exhibit some of her photographs, including this one. And I apologize for not having this on a slide. It's on the cover of my book. And it was of her torso post-mastectomy. And it's entitled Venus. And she said, um, after uh, having Venus displayed in an art gallery and looking at it, she realized that um, although I'm missing some pieces, I no longer feel disfigured. And uh, when her cancer recurred some years later, she uh, realized that uh, her Buddhist faith would help her. And she says, I'm moving into the unfamiliar, struggling for a sense of balance. The uh, other group of memoirs I wanted very briefly to talk about are um, older women uh, in their 60s when they were diagnosed. And um, their uh, works of autothanatography are a, a little bit different, I think. Um, they are concerned about the cultural invisibility of older women, forced retirement from satisfying professional careers, uh, family legacies. Um, one of these writers, Elizabeth Bryan, was a British pediatrician, and she wrote what is sometimes called a BRCA memoir, a memoir about genetic um, genetically influenced cancers because her family members, a number of them died of ovarian and um, breast cancer related to the BRCA uh, genetic mutation. And as a physician, she was really concerned about whether to have prophylactic surgeries, a topic we're hearing a lot about these days, and also how to tell her younger family members um, that, it's, um, that they are uh, at risk and when to do so, at what stages of their lives. Um, Ironically, this is a person who, after writing this really beautiful memoir about her family, not about herself, was contract, uh, contracted uh, pancreatic, pancreatic cancer, and she died uh, shortly thereafter. But before she did that, she did finish her memoir, and before she did that, she hosted her own memorial service, an idea that I really like. So I'm a party person. I want to be there. Uh, <laughs> And finally, Susan Gubar, who um, some of you may know because she writes columns for the New York Times. And she says, uh, rubbing a reader's nose in repugnant bodily disorder strikes me as a revolting and perverse act, but I want to attain veracity. And in Memoir of a Debulked Woman, she talks about the very gruesome aspects of her body that were challenged with her struggle with ovarian cancer. So I never seem to have answers only questions, but these are some of the questions that I continue to work with in my research. And also personally as somebody who, you know, now has reached retirement age myself, why are so many women today chronicling their experience of cancer and especially late stage cancer and testimonial and memorial projects? What ethical and cultural work is accomplished in these works of autothanatography? And how do readers, either individually, because reading can be a solitary act, or as part of reading groups, because these are wonderful books to read in book clubs and other classroom, um, as we found out in 2014, uh, classroom dialogue, and what insights, I think this is a very personal question, what insights do these works offer us as readers to understand our own uh, journeys through mortal time? Um, 
in, in the interest of time, I'll be moving quite rapidly through this. I just want to make one point that all of us have scripts about endings. And none of those scripts become real until you are literally facing the ending. And you may have heard yourselves or colleagues or friends say, we all have to go sometime. That remark is maybe cocktail party remark, elevator talk, but when you're in the, in the cancer land zone, it's a very serious issue. Um, thank goodness people have a sense of humor. Now, um, the experience of human beings confronting the prospect of death is what we refer to as mortal time, acute awareness of one's own mortality. This has been discussed for many years. Um, this is a slide from 1450. Ars Moriendi, The Art of a Good Death. Uh, Irvin uh, Yalom has a wonderful book called Staring at the Sun. Looking at mortality is a little bit like staring at the sun, which is a very hard thing to do. You can only take it small doses. Considering mortality is just the same thing. Eric's, Erickson has psychosocial stages where he teaches us about healthy aging and indeed considering one's own death at age 65, or I know no one here is 65 yet, but even uh, um, an earlier age is okay to consider and think about death and dying. Um, I will hold these stories about what we consider to be useful endings and not so useful endings from Louise and Betty till later on. Um, there is hope for a good ending and one of my um, favorite patients gave me this. It's, it's, a, it's a funny New Yorker cartoon, isn't it? Don't freak out, it's a save the date card. <laughs> my colleague, uh, my valued colleague, Mary DeShazer, through her talk, wove humor. And it's only with a sense of humor that one can walk closely to death without being enveloped by it, without being fried. So this was from a patient who herself had just gotten news that her cancer had metastasized to her brain. She had high health literacy. She knew that that was her um, ending, so to speak. I'm, I'm happy to say that she's doing quite well now. It's important to walk towards mortality, to engage it with a sense of humor and reality. Thank you for your attention. Thank you both so much. One of the challenges with these short talks, the brilliant part is that you get to hear a lot of different people very rapidly. The hard part is you might not get to hear quite as much as you want. There will be a question and answer session at the end. If you have questions, please feel free to write them down. And the speakers will also be available during lunch where you might be able to catch them. Next, I'd like to introduce Mark Espeland. He's a professor in the Department of Biostatistical Sciences at Wake Forest School of Medicine. He's going to be talking to you today about the Women's Health Initiative studies and how um, postmenopausal hormone, hormone therapy affects women's brains. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate and I'm honored to be here uh, in part uh, of this program. I enjoyed yesterday just so much, such wonderful speakers. Uh, um, let's see here. So anyone who's raised a, a teenager uh, suspects that changes in sex hormones uh, alters brain function. Uh, <laughs> for women, uh, after puberty, the second time that age-related changes markedly of, of hormone therapies occur is during the menopausal uh, transition when levels of estrogen in the body drop. And following this drop um, during menopause, the rate at which age-related chronic diseases accumulate uh, increases in women. Um, and it's been hypothesized that perhaps estrogen has something to do with this. And we heard some of this about, uh, about this with Dr. Olshansky yesterday, um, suspecting that uh, the accumulation of age-related diseases following the menopause has, has got to do something with the drop in estrogen. So the Women's Health Initiative was organized to improve our understanding of the aging process in, in women. Uh, over 160,000 women joined this program, many from here in the Piedmont. These were largely volunteers, and uh, included in the program were several large clinical trials 
to look at promising interventions designed to perhaps slow down aging and the accumulation of chronic diseases. One of these um, involved uh, using hormone therapy to increase the levels of estrogen in, in women following menopause. Wake Forest coordinated the part of this study that was involved with looking at the impact of hormone therapy on cognition and whether or not it might decrease women's risk of dementias and, and other sorts of Alzheimer's and, and Alzheimer's disease and other sorts of dementia. Over 7,400 women, again many from the Piedmont, uh, volunteered to participate in this program and involved annual cognitive assessments, tests to challenge women's memory and mental processing. Um, and uh, these were initially conducted uh, in clinics and later by telephone. Half these women had been assigned to hormone therapy and half had been assigned to placebo. And we had expected, or at least we'd hoped, that hormone therapy would slow down the rate of, of cognitive decline and, and prevent dementia. When women were finally uh, taken off of these medications and we were informed uh, what medications they were on, we were stunned to find that assignment to hormone therapy, and these women, they began at age of 65 and older, increased their risk of dementia by 76%. Uh, very much different than what we'd expected. So we've spent the subsequent decade trying to understand that here at Wake Forest. Our first step towards this um, occurred when 1,400 of these women volunteered to undergo magnetic resonance imaging of their brain. And this, uh, this process, scanning of the brain, measures brain volumes, and it also measures the buildup of subclinical cerebral vascular disease in the brain, sort of mini strokes. Usually these are undetectable. And we hypothesized that we knew that hormone therapy increased women's risk of stroke, and so we thought that likely the effect was caused by an increase of the clustering of, of these uh, ischemic lesion volumes, this cerebral vascular disease. Instead, we found that the dementia and the increased cognitive impairment was associated with loss of brain volumes, loss of brain cells. It wasn't the strokes, it was loss of the brain that was causing these. So how could this be? Um, our next evidence came from a large study that was done in France, and what it showed was that women uh, in the community that had higher levels of estrogen than other women, for whatever reason, and had diabetes, were at markedly increased risk of dementia. So how does hormone therapy cause the loss of brain matter? Well, there's been, uh, the, uh, the brain uses about 20% of the total energy of the body. And it does this during feast or famine, and whether you're thinking or daydreaming, whether you're awake or asleep. And the brain does much to maintain this stream of energy in the brain. Its primary source of fuel is glucose, blood sugar. But if this fails or is unsteady, it has backup sources that it, uh, sort of like backup generators that it uses. And, and these primarily are molecules called ketones. Oops. So what we found, we went back and, and looked at the women that were prescribed hormone therapy when they had diabetes. And what diabetes does is it makes the uh, energy from glucose be sort of unreliable and unstable. And so the body naturally transitions and the brain transitions to using backup energy sources. And what we found was that the women that had diabetes when they were prescribed the hormone therapy, these were the women that were most sensitive to the loss of brain tissue and most sensitive to the increases in dementia. And so what we're, we're thinking is what estrogen does in the brain, um, one of my co-authors, uh, Roberto Diaz Brinton, has termed estrogen as a master regulator of brain energy mechanism. And what estrogen does in the brain is promotes the use of glucose, but in doing so it also decreases the ability to use ketones and secondary energy sources. And so you get this natural tension in the brain, and the brain, when and these older women are given hormone therapy, um, isn't giving the energy it needs, and that leads to loss of a brain tissue. So it's a natural question. Hormone therapy is prescribed to women at younger ages than what I've, I've talked about in this study for the treatment of menopausal symptoms, and it remains a recommended therapy for that. So is it safe for younger women's brains? And we are fortunate to have uh, among the Women's Health Initiative cohort 
uh, a volunteer group of about 2,300 women who agreed to undergo cognitive stain uh, testing. And these were women that had been given hormone therapy in their early 50s, much nearer to the time of menopause. And what we found was that there was no lingering effect on cognitive function in these women that were prescribed hormone therapy at the time of their menopause. And there's been a couple of other studies that have corroborated this as well. So we feel like hormone therapy is safe for women's brains when it's prescribed for treating menopausal symptoms, but it's not safe if it's prescribed later on. So what can we do um, towards maintaining our overall cognitive health? Well, the Women's Health Initiative has, has given us a lot of information on that. And it, what we've found so far in, in the field is that there's no one thing that, that, that seems to work, but there potentially is many things in concert that can be used to maintain health, maintain your cognitive health. And, and one is in middle age, uh, try and keep yourself healthy. You know, prevent these chronic diseases from building up hypertension, depression, cardiovascular disease. Adopt a healthy lifestyle. This is just common sense. Uh, try and maintain your physical function. Try and eat a healthy diet. Um, it might help you later on in life. Uh, for younger folks, um, what we've found is, is getting a, a high level of college education or getting some early training appears to build up a reserve in your brain that might be able to protect you later in life from uh, age-related uh, loss of, 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 of brain matter. And finally, take care of the environment. Um, if you live in a, in a healthy neighborhood, if you live in an area with lower ozone levels, or if you live in a, labor, uh, in a neighborhood with lower pollution levels, um, you're less likely to end up with, with dementia and loss of brain tissue. Mm -hmm. So at the time the Women's Health Initiative was, was organized, uh, one of the, the leading prescription drugs in the country for women uh, was, was, post, was Premarin and, and Premarin products. Um, at that point, it was estimated about 11% of the market share of Premarin was for women aged 75 and older, much distance from, from menopause. And, and it's presumed that this was being prescribed for preventing or attempting to prevent chronic diseases. Through the Women's Health Initiative and the volunteerism of the women that were involved, um, now every bottle of Premarin says, uh, do not use estrogen to prevent dementia, and also using estrogens uh, may increase your chance of getting dementia based on a study of women 65 years and older. So the Women's Health Initiative is continuing. There's still nearly 100,000 women involved now. And it's, it's moved into a, really a study of aging in these women and trying to identify factors that are associated with longer longevity. Many of these women are in their 80s and 90s and the first centenarians in the cohort have, have now evolved. Um, these women are, are being followed every year. Um, we've got funding through 2020 to, to continue to follow these women. And we're continuing to ass assess their cognitive function and looking for strategies that might uh, maintain their cognitive health. Now Wake Forest and the School of Medicine has identified um, Alzheimer's disease as, a, as a, a priority for its research and it's making substantial investments in that. And these investments have been going on for a long period of time, but it looks like uh, they'll be sustained for some, some period. One of the programs involved with the medical center is, is the Alzheimer's disease prevention program. And it's organized to try and better inform us about the transition from normal aging to some impairment to dementia and try and identify ways that uh, this might be ameliorated and, and treated. Um, I put this slide up here. There's a, a website that you can visit there's opportunities to engage with research if you'd like. There's also a, a lot of information up there about Alzheimer's disease. So I'll welcome any questions at this point, or should I wait? Okay. I have one question. Well, it's, it's right now, the, the guidelines for prescribing estrogen is to use it for treating menopausal symptoms, and then as, that, as they get resolved, uh, come off of the medications. So typically the course is, is a one or two years, but some women menopausal symptoms can persist for much longer. Yeah. Thank you, Mark.
And like Mark was saying, we also, there is information on the web about the, some of the research he was talking about. There's also a table um, out for during the interaction time where there's more information about the research going on at our aging center. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce some important members of our community, um, Lee Covington and Melissa Smith, who are from Senior Services. And they're going to talk with you for the next 12 minutes about um, aging with purpose and programs that are going on right now at Senior Services to support that. Good morning. We are so uh, grateful and uh, honored to be given the opportunity to tell you about our new program called Aging with Purpose. Uh, within 12 minutes, we're gonna cover a lot. We're gonna let you know a little bit about who we are, uh, what, this, what the aging statistics look like in Forsyth County, and what we're doing. What is Aging with Purpose? First of all, Senior Services is a uh, private nonprofit agency serving seniors in Forsyth County. We have 2,200 volunteers, 115 staff, 65 board members, a whopping 3,700 donors, and we serve 1,550 elder care partners in the community. We have seven programs, Williams Adult Day Center, Helpline, Meals on Wheels, home care, group lunches, living at home, and we operate under a $6 million annual budget, and our mission is to help our elderly live with dignity. We have two locations, one's right around the corner. Uh, you may have come by it on the way here. It's at 2895 Shore Fair Drive, and the other is our Williams Adult Day Center located at 231 Melrose Street, right down the street from Baptist Hospital. So I'm going to take a few minutes to try to paint a picture of aging in Forsyth County. And we've titled this, The Handwriting is on the Wall, because it is, as you'll see. Every day, 10,000 people, baby boomers, are turning 65 across the U.S. And that's a trend that will continue until the year 2030. Forsyth County, as you might imagine, is part of that. By the year 2030, our age group of 60 plus will increase a whopping 124%, yielding more than 100,000 people in that age bracket. This next chart breaks that down even further by age category, and you'll see that the greatest percentage increase really comes in those, those tiers, age 75 to 84 and age 85 plus. <clears throat> it's important to note where people are living. 64% live with family. About 3% live in group quarters or institutional settings. But 30% live alone. And of those, 74% are women. Poverty is a major concern. We hear a lot about that. In Forsyth County, we estimate more than 3,000 Adults age 65 and over are living below the federal poverty level. Occurring with that is lack of access to transportation. Over 3,000 households in Forsyth County who have a person age 65 and older living there do not have access to a vehicle. And further compounding this is food insecurity. We've heard a lot about it with children it also impacts seniors. North Carolina ranks ninth in the U.S. for food insecurity for people 60 and older at just under 8%. So a conservative estimate in Forsyth County is more than 11,000 people age 60 and older experience food insecurity on a regular basis. So compared to their food secure peers, they're much more likely to have major health concerns and need assistance with activities of daily living such as eating, bathing and dressing. All of these things impact the lives of elders in our community and strip away their simple pleasures one at a time. I'm going to turn it over to Melissa for a quick example. Great. So we're going to, um, if you could humor us for about a minute and a half, everybody take a piece of paper and a pen at your table. 
and quickly write down five or six simple pleasures in your life. Things that you enjoy, but you have to be able to share these with somebody at your table, so be careful. Um, gardening, you know, here's some good examples. Gardening, music, your morning coffee, your children, your grandchildren. So quickly write down five or six of these. We'll give you uh, about 20 more seconds. Okay, now take that piece of paper and give it to somebody else, quickly. Now that you've received somebody else's list of simple pleasures, take off, cross off all but five of those simple pleasures. Just take them all away. Take, take all but, I'm sorry, take all but two away. Sorry about that. Don't even think about it. Just take away all but two of their simple pleasures and give their paper back to them. So, so one, once you've gotten your paper back, everybody should have their simple pleasures back. There are only two left. How, how does that make you feel? Very sad, very resentful, very angry. <laughs> this is only a uh, pretend, guys. You don't, have, you don't need to get angry with each other. <laughs> you get them back when you need. Yeah, you'll get them back. So, so we wanted to do this exercise to really demonstrate what happens sometimes when we age. A lot of our elders, um, for various reasons, are stripped of their simple pleasures. It could be due to the traditional model of care, uh, somebody's safety concerns. You know, think about uh, grandmom can't keep her cat anymore because the doctor said she was a fall risk. You know, she's had her cat for 10 years. Uh, it could be due to financial reasons uh, and just to frailty. And as we succumb, to being stripped away of these simple pleasures, you know, we're liable to be affected by um, what we call the three plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. And that's why we've started the Aging with Purpose program. So why Aging with Purpose and why now? Well, as we just learned, only 3% of elders in Forsyth County are living in a facility. The rest are living at home. What we hear is that that's really where people want to stay, is in their home. And so these statistics that we've talked about are daunting and they're impacting lives and we want to create better health outcomes for everyone. We really want to reintegrate elders back into this community using an aging in community model. You hear about aging in place, we want to support aging in community. And we want to prepare this community to embrace elderhood as a key part of the life cycle. And in doing so, combat that ageism that we heard about this morning that's really pervasive in our society. Simply put, it's the right thing to do. So Aging with Purpose is based on some principles. You heard about those three plagues, loneliness, helplessness, and boredom, create much of the suffering for elders today. The human spirit is often corroded by lack of meaningful activity. So the opportunity to do things that we find meaningful really is essential to good human health. We want to reduce social isolation and find ways for everyone on the care partner team to become deeply known. For loving companionship is the antidote to loneliness. And we want to create opportunities for elders to give as well as to receive. Often as professionals, we give, we take care of, and there are opportunities for them to give back. And really focus on a person-centered approach around caring for the whole person, including physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, every need that they may have. So we've started a pilot. We're in the first phase, and we've begun to do some life stories or living histories. This gives us an opportunity to really glean who they are. It doesn't focus on their deficits. It's about their gifts 
and who makes them who they are. We're looking at creating, creating opportunities to build relationships and to build on existing relationships in an effort to reduce social isolation. And discover opportunities for meaningful activity, again, based on what is meaningful to each individual person, that chance to give as well as to receive. And throughout this process, we're measuring outcomes that you're going to hear a little bit more about and the impact of each thing that we do. So how are we gathering uh, these living histories or the stories? We're using a program called Living History, which is a uh, licensed story gathering program that's typically used in uh, hospital or long-term care settings. And it's used to improve patient satisfaction and build rapport. We're the first community-based organization to utilize this program. And it's an open-ended, structured interview that Lee touched on this, really helps us glean out who they are, and it doesn't focus on their deficits. We're actually asking them what matters to them, what makes them tick, what are their gifts, uh, what are their abilities, what do they still want to do, what are their goals? And pictured here uh, is an elder care partner who receives Meals on Wheels. When we interviewed him, he was very lonely, very isolated. He's in a lot of pain. And we offered him the opportunity to volunteer. We have a program called our Telephone Reassurance Program. He's a retired minister. And now he is making telephone calls to other homebound elders. And instead of him always thanking us for the meals that we are providing to him, we get to call him and thank him for his service as a telephone reassurance volunteer. We've We've also uh, embraced the Eden Alternative. Some people in this room may have heard about the Eden Alternative uh, and Eden at Home. Eden Alternative was uh, founded by Dr. Bill Thomas in upstate New York over 20 years ago in a nursing home setting where he discovered that elders were suffering from the three plagues of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. It's driven by a 10 principle philosophy that reconnects elders to their communities it de-emphasizes the traditional model of care and embraces person-directed care and creates opportunities for elders to give as well as receive. And through this, really what we're striving for is systemic culture change, not just change in our agency and how we serve our elders, but a very deliberate systemic culture change. We've not only trained folks in the Eden Alternative within our agency, but there are people represented in this room that came to our trainings that we had, and we've just started agency-wide trainings this month. We are changing our language. We're using terms like elder. We're re you know, embracing that word. Elderhood is a key part of the life cycle. We're not just employees, we're all care partner teams, and the folks that we serve are our elder care partners. We're all becoming well-known to each other, and we've embraced a new definition of care, which is to help another to grow. And we're helping our elders to grow as we serve them. So in summary, we have Eden trained staff and volunteers. We're collecting living histories. We have uh, validated outcome measures where we're measuring quality of life, depression, healthcare utilization, etc. We're connecting our elders with programs or interventions based on their skills and strengths. Our long-term goals really are to have our community embrace elderhood. Don't be afraid of it. If we're lucky, we're going to get there. Re-engaging our elders back into the community, letting them know we need you. We need your insights. We need your skills. We need your wisdom. We want to prolong good health and quality of life and create an aging-friendly community. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Um, that was lovely. We also are, um, it's my privilege to next introduce Carol Roan. And she's going to give a talk called We Can All Sing. I'd like to say one more thing about this. So 
the part of this um, multidisciplinary symposium was meant to engage people across different disciplines, but you may have noticed that we're also trying to engage between the community and the academic environment, which we feel don't always exchange information in this way. So Carol Rohn is also a community member who's going to speak about her work in um, the world of arts and writing. Yes, I also think I'm here because I'm 84, so <laughs> that's what I'm representing as well. <laughs> Miss Sarah Hedston came to me for voice lessons when she was 72 years old. If you had seen her at that time, you would have thought, what a old lady. She was white-haired, a devout churchgoer, a retired social worker, and a cancer survivor. But, she said, bad experiences in elementary school had squelched something in her that needed to come out. She'd been told that she couldn't match pitch, but she dearly wanted to sing, and she'd heard that I could teach anybody to sing. <laughs> well, teaching is what I put down on forms, but that's not really what I do. What I do is to pull out the weeds of ridiculous ideas that we have about singing that keeps us back from singing. Now, Sarah was probably in the second grade, because that's when this usually happens. I think in uh, one study there was 15% of people report that they cannot sit, match pitch and cannot sing on tune. <laughs> you know, uh, ridiculous. And, <laughs> it's, it's, um, and I'll explain why, why in a minute. Um, you see, we're, uh, our vocal mechanism is much more like that of birds than of other mammals. And so we are born singers. Our speaking voice is only used part of that mechanism. So if you're going through life without singing, you're losing on a lot of what your humanity is. Uh, little birds are born singing what Gardner calls little bird songs. And, and we are born singing, we are cooing, we're doing, we're making some sounds in rhythm, uh, and we get a little older and we're kind of tunelessly singing, but that's not what gets praised. It's when we imitate our primary caregiver's voice and say, mama, that, you know, well, well that's the great thing in life. It's not those sounds we've been making. And it turns out that it's a developmental skill to be taught a song. That happens with birds at a specific age. For humans, it's a longer stretch of time, but received wisdom or some awful person in the educational uh, world has decided that we should do that at second grade. So we get tested at second grade, and then we're told, okay, you stand in the back of the chorus at the spring recital, you see. And then the rest of our lives, we're not, we're not only deprived of the joy of singing, but we deprive ourselves of a lot of music, and we know how important that is to the brain. You'll see that uh, tonight in that film. But it's also that, you know, we have this deficit. There's something wrong with us. It kind of lies buried uh, all the time. Uh, so we took care of the pitch, you know, quite quickly. Uh, but then Sarah decided that she was a little bit bored with the hymns that we had started out with. And what she was really interested in was Gershwin and Ellington, songs from the 30s and the 40s. What surprised me a great deal was that it, when I looked back at my records a few weeks ago, 
It only took two years for Sarah to turn into an entertainer. She bought a red sequined outfit <laughs> and she sang programs at nursing homes around town at age 74. Smith Hageman was an entrepreneur here in Winston-Salem. He founded and built a company. And when he retired, he turned all of that energy to golf. And he became senior, I'm not, don't know golf, senior <laughs> champion of the Carolinas, North Carolina and South Carolina. Smith was the champion. But then when he got into his 80s, uh, his body began to deteriorate. He was in a great deal of pain in the hospital, in rehab, and in depression. His daughter told me recently that she didn't know what Smith would have done in his later years if he hadn't found writing. That's what he found. He sat down at 86 and wrote his first adventure novel. And then he set out to teach himself the craft, well, to learn the craft, and to research absolutely every fact in that book. I will tell you that it is possible to survive above the Arctic Circle in a certain period of year because Smith found the expert on Arctic flora and fauna who was teaching just up in Boone. Um, and I came to know him because he came to one of my workshops. And then he asked me to edit the book. And I tell you, we have them for sale <laughs> down on, at the four o'clock, uh, down on the table down there. And it's a terrific read. My army colonel's son bought a copy on my recommendation and wrote me a whole paragraph of how skillful and intelligent Smith was as a writer. When he left this earth at 91, he had had two books published by an independent press and was work at work on his third. Cheryl Davis retired as a therapist uh, from the children's home. She said, I knew there was something more in me I just didn't know what it was. So she tried poetry for a few years, and then she took a few painting lessons, and that was it. More art classes uh, and an Arts Council grant, and she, her work is now hung in national jury shows in just two and a half years. We have a couple of her paintings downstairs, too. This something that Sarah said wanted to come out, the something that Cheryl said she needed to find, and the word finding that Smith's daughter used about his writing, this is the creative spirit. And I believe that creativity is next only to survival as an urge, a need, a drive. I don't know, sometimes I call it the soul. But every culture and every civilization that has had enough resources to survive, enough food, enough water and shelter, has left behind evidence of their creativity, whether that's in the form of tools that they made, or whether it's the decoration on their cooking pots. Often a metaphor is used that we're like flowers, you know, we bloom, and then we wither, and then we die. And now we're like birds. We can sing until we die. Janet Joyner is another member of the community. She has a PhD in French and French literature and taught at the university level for many years. She is now in her 80s, and her first book of poetry just won the 2015 Holland Prize. 
Janet says that she has learned more about poetry in the last five years than in her entire lifetime. Creativity, these can be the richest years in our life because what creativity is is learning and growth. I was so had, glad to hear the word growth from the last speakers. We can learn what we were told we couldn't learn. We can do what we were told we couldn't do. We can do what, more or less, what we want to do and explore and, and find satisfaction, actually, during these years. I have another friend, Fyodor Pitcairn, who was the president and CEO of the Pitcairn uh, Finance Group. This is in Pennsylvania. In his 70s, uh, Feo became an underwater cinematographer. And he wasn't even diving in a cage, he was diving in a wetsuit. His work was presented by PBS in a five-part series. When the Smithsonian was going to open its ocean room, they asked Feo to create a special feature. So if you go to the ocean room, you can see his work in HD video around the ocean room walls. When his doctor told him he couldn't dive anymore because he's now in his 80s, he turned to still photography. And his third book came out this summer, Primordial Landscapes. I, have to, I sometimes forget names, but I always did. That is, has nothing to do with how old I am. Um, Primordial Landscapes, Iceland Revealed. So now there's a little room in the Smithsonian with Feo's photo marvelous photographs around uh, the, the walls. And his book launch party was held there, and the president of Iceland came. I want to close with Feo's wife, Kirsten. Uh, she became one of my closest friends, but I didn't know her until she was quite ill in her 70s. Uh, she was, became so ill that she couldn't spend nights alone when Fail was off in some ocean or other, so I spent the night with her. She had been raised and educated in South Africa. And one night I was sitting by her bed and she was reminiscing about the Zulu music, which she had absolutely loved. And then she began to sing me a Zulu song. As I said, she was in her 70s. She was very fragile. Her speaking voice was weak and raspy. But when she sang in Zulu to me, it was one of the most glorious voices I have ever heard. Strong, it was the strong voice of the 22-year-old woman that she had been that was still inside her. Thank you. So, any, are there any questions? Nobody wants to know how to sing? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carol. Um, we have one more speaker. Um, that I'll introduce, and then we'll have the question and answer session. Our cleanup um, batter, is that the right term, Steve? <laughs> Sports analogy, um, is Steve Krzyzewski. He's the head of the Pepper Center and the Stick Center on Aging at Wake Forest School of Medicine. And he's going to give a talk on t entitled, Is There a Pill That Can Delay Aging? Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers. Incredible conference. Uh, I'm learning so much. So my eyes have been opened in so many important ways. Um, and but uh, I'm pleased to be able to share some of the work that I'm working on uh, right now, which is trying to determine whether there might be a pill that can be delay aging. And I want to make one thing clear. I'm not saying make you live longer. Uh, I think Dr. Oshansky yesterday uh, made the case. We're not interested in extending the limits of human life. What we're interested in is having healthy life for every year of life that you live. As healthy a life as possible, not as long a life as possible. So this is a projection of spending on Medicare, which has all the policy makers of up at night, and the line that you see there is sort of current expenditures, and and this represents the uh, uh, the the moral of the story of this slide is that we are the victims of our own success. We have been incredibly successful over the last hundred years of reducing early mortality in in, in childhood in. Uh, a, a women of childbearing age through the midlife. Uh, and the consequence of that is a historically high proportion of our population that is older. And if their disease experience continues the way it has in the past, uh, the math suggests that these are the outlays that Medicare would have to have over the next, uh, I think there's a, a 50 year or even longer projection uh, to keep up with that and essentially is doubling uh, the contribution uh, 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 of uh, doubling the, the proportion of our gross national product or domestic product that goes to healthcare for elders than now. So this is um, a challenge that we're taking on in society at many levels. Those of us sort of in the medical community sort of see and in the biology community sees this as part of the, uh, the, the premise of a solution. So this represents uh, the age incidence lines of many different, or, or the age mortality lines for many different diseases. And if you look at the uh, y-axis, you'll see it's a logarithmic scale which means that most of the diseases that affect us increase as a power function with age. Not linearly, they don't go up one a year, it goes up times a year. So, um, for example, uh, someone with heart, uh, the chances of dying from heart disease are a thousand times greater in an older person than a younger person. Uh, so very important, and you'll see how many of them go up. So this has led to, uh, well, uh, we are coming from a paradigm uh, which is uh, we can delay specific diseases through attacking specific risk factors for those diseases. And this is a one disease at a time strategy. Um, this is how our current, uh, this is how NIH, our major funder, is set up. It's set up in institutes having to do with individual organs primarily. This is how the Food and Drug Administration approaches the drug approval process. They approve one drug for one mechanism for one outcome. Um, but we think the, that this, uh, this slide suggests there is a common mechanism to most of the diseases that people face with old age, and that is an aging process. So we suggest there's a better approach that if we can delay aging by targeting the molecular processes of aging, we'll be able to delay multiple age-related diseases simultaneously. If we solve one disease problem, we're just switching one problem for another because they're all going up exponentially with age. So if we can prevent you from getting heart disease, that makes you at risk for all the other things on that slide. We would like to have a coordinated strategy that addresses them all simultaneously. Okay, this is a quiz part of the game, uh, the show. What do yeast nematodes, which are tiny little worms, fruit flies, and mice have in common? 
Well, what they have in common is that these are workhorses of, uh, of research models to identify the molecular pathways that relate to aging. And this goes through a process. Uh, you can either identify long-lived individuals of these kinds of species or even look at different species at different lifespans. And then, um, and I make this sound easy, this is decades worth of work to then tease out the underlying biologic differences between the long-lived worm and the short-lived worm or the long-lived mouse and the short-lived mouse to identify what's going, what's different in the cells that explains that difference in how long they live. Uh, and then with, uh, again, another decades long process is to identify uh, molecules that could turn into drugs someday that target those pathways. And finally, that you assess, if we give a mouse this compound, does it make the uh, mouse live longer? And most importantly, does it increase the health span of the mouse? So mice accumulate disease with age just like humans do and they can use this technique to see how fast those are occurring and see if the health span of the mouse is extended. So the National Institute on Aging, which is one of the National Institutes of Health, runs something called the Interventions Testing Program where scientists from all over the world can nominate drugs to try in very large model uh, mouse experiments that are done in outbred mouse in two different locations simultaneously in male and female mice because their life histories are different just as they are for men and women. And they have had five compounds that they've tested that actually do extend the longevity and health span of mice at least in one gender of mouse. Aspirin, has anyone heard of that? Yes. So remarkably, that is uh, associated with uh, gain in life expectancy, particularly in male mice. A carbos is a drug that's used to treat diabetes, uh, has shown some promise. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what NDGA is, because I can't. It's a really long chemical name, but uh, uh, it also has some uh, longevity benefits in, in, in males, 17 alpha estradiol, which is not what the, the women and women health in, uh, initiative got, but a related compound. Uh, and the current leader in the derby is a drug called rapamycin, which is actually used as a uh, anti-rejection uh, drug and immune modulator for transplant patients. And it has led to impressive gains in lifespan and health span in both male and female mice. Uh, some things that haven't worked, uh, simvastatin, which is one of the statin drugs for people used to lower their cholesterol. A lot of press about something called resveratrol, which at least in the mice doesn't work. So there are some promising candidates, and at least uh, uh, three of the on this list are already FDA approved. So the next question is, how would you test this in humans? How would you go from a promising product or compound in a mice into a human? And this is a little small screen, I think, for the size of the room. But on the left, you've got some very uh, quick and short-term things you could do. I could uh, take a volunteer in the room or a series of you and offer you the pill and measure your cellular processes, and we can do this from muscle or fat or from blood cells, and see if the compound I gave you changed that cellular process uh, in such a way that it was consistent with all the other things we know about aging and, and would use that to say, yeah, this might uh, uh, confer benefits. Uh, we might look for immediate changes in what we call age-related phenotypes. These are things that increase with aging, and if we uh, slowed or delayed aging, these would improve. And this might be something like your gait speed or your strength. Uh, we could look for the uh, change in the rate with which you develop certain age-related diseases, like uh, cancer, heart disease, or Alzheimer's. 
uh, we could look to your, at your, the mortality rate of a group of people. We could give a drug to thousands of people and see, see what happens to them. And finally, look to see what total lifespan is. Now, the problem with these strategies is the closer you get to your goal, the more expensive it is. And we certainly can't do what we do in mice. In mice, they start giving them these compounds at about 12 uh, a year, 12 months of age. That's the equivalent of giving it to a 40-year-old human and then following them for the rest of their lives. That's never going to happen. It's not going to happen for practical reasons, and it's not going to happen for ethical reasons. There's another problem with that which is the regulatory interest. The FDA, especially for drugs addressing a thing for the first time, aren't really interested in things like strength or um, uh, walking ability. They're really disease focused. And so they're only interested in improving drugs, certainly for new mechanisms, that can be shown to affect or pre prevent or treat a disease. FDA does not consider aging a disease. I don't think anyone in this room should, but they do, but they are not very impressed by drugs that address thing, the many common complaints that older people have, and this is a problem. It's a problem for a couple of reasons. One is that means no one's to develop drugs where you can't get them approved. That's the major one. And so, uh, we were part of a, a, a team, and uh, Mark Esplin, and your Barzlai, and I, uh, and many others, including Dr. Olshansky, uh, met with the FDA about a year ago to argue for an approval process that would allow a pill that affected many disease outcomes, not just one, to be approved and licensed in the United States. And they were very sympathetic to that. And so we proposed this study called Targeting a Aging with Metformin. Uh, metformin is an anti-diabetic drug or given people with diabetes. It's been used for over 60 years. It's generic, very inexpensive. And most importantly, um, all, there's data at least in people with diabetes for a multiplicity of effects that suggests it may indeed have an effect on the underlying process of aging. It's associated with prevention of cardiovascular disease, cancer. Uh, people who take it have lower total mortality than uh, people with diabetes who are taking other drugs. Uh, we really don't know about cognition or dementia yet, but there's very little studies on that. I'm not going to really go through this, but what we're planning and trying to get funded right now is a study to involve 3,000 older people, 65 to 79 years of age, who are at risk for age-related diseases or may have already had one. And then uh, they'd be in a study for about uh, four years, and we'll count and see what happens. And if our premise is right, that metformin does affect the underlying aging process, then what we would predict to see, if we were correct, is that the rate of accumulation of new age-related health conditions and diseases would be slower in the group getting the metformin compared to the group that was getting a placebo. Uh, so this is uh, what we're looking for, the, the fountain of youth. Uh, do I think metformin is the drug? It's promising. I'm sure there will be better compounds out there. But no one's going to look for them unless there is a path blaze that allows investors, uh, quick side comment, about $300 million a year from federal money going to aging research. Uh, if, invest, if the amount of investment capital that could go to this, if there was a pathway for it, would probably be 10 times that. So the whole field is sort of being retarded because the people who have the the deep pockets have no interest in aging because they don't see a path for any return in investment. Thank you. I got, I got hands. I got hands. Can I answer yeah, questions? Yeah. Why don't we go ahead and let everybody come up Great. and ask questions. Okay. So um, if all the speakers would come forward to the front. Then we have microphones on the left and on the right for questions. There are students who will help, um, and committee members who will help bring the microphones to people in the audience. 
So please go ahead and l raise your hand if you have questions. And we will entertain questions until noon when it is time for lunch. Hello, I'm Leah Miller with Creative Aging Network NC and uh, Dr. Krzynski, sorry. You um, mentioned the FDA was sympathetic uh, when you met with them about this idea of targeting multiple diseases with one drug. What does that mean exactly? Are they open to, if your results come back positive, are they open to creating that pathway or is there much more work to be done? Uh, the impression that the group who met with them in, in some follow-up uh, uh, email exchanges is that they're open to it, uh, that, they, that this is, would make sense to them. It fits into the constraints that the law puts on them in, the, in, the, in what they're allowed to approve and not approve, whereas they are, were not sympathetic to things like gate speed, uh, muscle strength, and they're, they're not. There are people trying to change their mind on those, but but they're really interested. They're they are built to look at disease, not to function as the outcome of interest. Other questions? I'm sorry. Can I do a quick follow-up question to that? What is the time? frame then for your study? How, how long before results would come out? Well, if someone uh, writes a check today, <laughs> uh, we would be in the field in about six to nine months and start recruiting about, uh, about nine months from the day the check uh, that we get the resources to start. And so um, to, uh, we'd be done with the study in 20, 22, roughly, so. The behind, there's one, a woman behind you first. Uh, did you say you were going to start the study on metformin? Did, is there a start time? No, I, I, we are looking to have, uh, get this supported. So we're looking for the support from the National Institute on Aging. We have a, um, pro, a pro proposal pending with them and um, also with the support of the American Federation for Aging Research, they're actually looking for people to pay, uh, for people with uh, interest in both aging and big bank accounts <laughs> to directly fund, fund the study. So. Do you think the um, problem is the lobbyist? Because this always comes to dollars and cents with the gate speed. I mean, what, what seems to be blocking well, uh, when we visited the FDA, they qu quoted their statutory, uh, pr w what the law mandates that they consider back to us. So things like um, um, strength, per se, uh, is not a disease and it's not a health condition. It's a what physiologic can, state. What can we do? As right. citizens. Well, I, I, uh, you can certainly write our Congress, uh, congressional delegations to say this is very important to older adults and also to make your voice uh, heard uh, so to the uh, FDA saying uh, being very weak or very slow is something very important to our well-being and our quality of life and that is something they are interested in proving drugs for, and that would be a path forward for that. Could, could I just say that North Carolina... Uh, well, I can probably yell at, through the whole thing, but I can just say that our North Carolina Senator, Tom Tillis, sits on the Council on Aging, or the Committee on Aging in the Senate, and he's got a really smart staffer named Matt Flynn that I've been complaining to because the drug that keeps me alive, I was supposed to be dead at 65, and the drug that keeps me alive went up 12, 13 fold last year. So I'm talking to Matt Flynn. But our man is, sits on the Committee on Aging, so. Okay. 
Uh, uh, first, thanks so much for this interdisciplinary program. It's fabulous. Mm. I have a question about, um, I, I have a, a concern about the medicalization of aging. And I wonder if it's possible to, and maybe it takes rewriting the statute, so that the NIH can talk about promoting health and promoting cellular health or resiliency or something. Because once you start to target aging as the risk factor, what we see now in terms of anti-aging drugs and, and potions and lotions is going to increase exponentially. And the chances of having a society that welcomes and encourages people of all ages is going to be decimated if anti-aging is considered a medical reality. So, and I speak as someone who's worked in the gay rights movement and the feminist movement, and once those things were, you know, once being feminine was considered weakness, once gay was being considered pathological, the chances of having equal rights were really slow. So could you speak to that? And I'd love to hear from some of the other speakers on that. I have just a quick comment. I think one of the things that we're trying to do with Aging with Purpose is find ways to create, to, to touch medical issues and concerns with non-medical interventions. And so we're hoping to begin to do that. And as quality of life and sense of meaning and purpose improves, we hope that general and overall health will improve. So uh, I, I get your I, I take your point. I think it's a very important one. Uh, but, uh, and I think what the goal, you call it the medicalization of aging. I think of it slightly different, which is to disassociate as much as we can age from disease. Because right now those are, in most people's mind, conflated. Think of an older person, and if you put it that way, or think of an older adult, they think of somebody who might be on a walker or something. Uh, we, we need to find ways to break that connection so that the positive side of aging isn't, uh, the negative side isn't the first thing in the stereotype that everyone thinks about. And so I, I think addressing the, uh, when, uh, addressing um, this from a biologic standpoint, I think is sort of, neutral with respect to that goal, that would help because if it's now, if we can break that connection between aging disease, then people won't make that connection. It won't be as salient to them. So I, I, I see this, as, that's a, you, the topic is extremely uh, interesting and manifold, but that, that's sort of the way I see it. So. I think also, um, for as long as I've been alive, you know, you have life and you have death. And it's always been a separate issue. You know, you're either living or you're dead. And um, I think in some other cultures, dying is a part of life. And I think if we could ever change our paradigm to think about dying as a part of life, then we might think about living as long as we live which would also help us think in ways to make it more possible to improve our quality of life and not separate those things as if they are mutually exclusive. Did either of you all have something you'd like to say about that? It's a very wise comment. And the point I started out with was that we all have scripts about our living and dying. And as a denizen of cancer land, um, our work takes us very close to patients who have to think about this. There's an age appropriateness about thinking about mortality. If your seven-year-old comes up and says, listen, Dad, I want to talk about an advanced directive, that would be unusual. But if a 60-year-old does that, or it's, it's appropriate. So um, part of the work in the cancer center involves helping people make choices about what can be possible. There are some very, very bad deaths that we can have. And working in an ICU, there may be some nursing or medical staff here or people who've been there with your family members, you know there can be some very bad deaths. Eric Erickson suggests that wisdom is a part of aging and that part of that wisdom would be encountering mortality in a way that opens one's eyes. 
It helps to open one's eyes toward dying, but it doesn't assure a good death. Generally is labor out. Labor in, labor out. But the likelihood of a ars moriende, the art of dying a good death, increases with eyes wide open. Just this week I was called to talk with a, a woman who was told that her chemotherapy was not working and that it had, had moved very quickly. I know going in that her median survival is about six months. The patient decided that she didn't want to know about her life expectancy, told the clinician, but when we talked a little bit longer about that, it became, she, she knew, she had a sense of it, but it takes time. These things can't be done in 15 minute consults. Um, I appreciate your wisdom with regard to living and dying and weaving that into the culture. There's a lot of work to do and you've heard some wonderful examples of how that's being done here today. We'll take two more questions. We have one over here and one back here. Um, the, um, our city and county recreation departments sponsor the senior games and senior activities. And I wonder if any of these programs coordinate with that in terms of um, aging gracefully or however you want to describe it. We do and we hope to do more. I think as we're becoming more deeply known with the elders that are involved in the work that we do, we're going to learn about the things that they want to do, the gifts and the skills that they have, the things you've illustrated this morning so beautifully. And I think it will be an opportunity for us to then engage more deeply with senior games, with the silver arts, and really encourage those people that are not currently involved to become involved. To follow up, this is all really new to us because most of the people uh, that we serve are homebound. So we're, we're getting creative and we're thinking about, you know, interventions and things that we can put in place to really bring our seniors back out into the community. I believe we had one more question. Danny or? Okay, he's coming. My name is Bill Hazard and I'm a geriatrician and I'd like to shout, give a shout out to senior services. Uh, I moved back from Seattle to Winston-Salem where I have an office in the Stick Center and because it's really a good place to be and aging is appreciated in this community. By contrast, I was on the board of senior services in Seattle and that was an organization that nobody basically wanted to admit existed because it was for the poor people of, of it was a federal program for the poor people of Seattle and it received no community support that I could identify. Here senior services is a community program and you're reaching out and, and, and expanding even more is, is, a, is a testimony to the breadth of your vision and I want to salute you for that. Thank you. I've got a funny story with you when I end it that way, but I don't care if you don't. Um, so I'd like to say one thing first. I'd like to acknowledge Bill Hazard for those in the room who don't know. Um, he literally wrote the book on geriatrics. It's the major textbook that's used. So I appreciate the comment and the insight. <laughs> two quick housekeeping notes, and then I'm going to let Carol Roan close this out. Um, so the two quick housekeeping notes are that the next thing on the agenda is lunch. It is set up on either end here. You may definitely eat at your tables and also feel free to explore some of the tables and opportunities to learn more out in the interaction area. Um, the other thing is please keep in mind that we have these um, areas where you can write questions, comments, thoughts, anything you have to say on these large pieces of paper. There are markers at both ends. It sounds like the dialogue that's starting here is really interesting and um, it's hard to be able to hear everything we'd like to hear from the number of people that are thinking about this. So on that. I just told Christine if she wanted to end with a funny story, I had one. Uh, <laughs> I used to teach a writing class actually for several years up in the, uh, the Living Well, which is a senior center in Rural Hall. And so at one point I urged them to 
enter the Silver Arts, which is pro part of the Silver Games. Well, they did, but then they heard that there was a cheerleading contest, too. <laughs> so I don't teach there anymore, you know. These women, and I, Hortense was the oldest. She was 85 when they formed this. And so they've got this cheerleading group, and they're so heavily booked around the area that, that they don't have time to write. So 